presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. What's going on, my Racecoin fans? I'm joined by Mike Skeen, an American professional driver with a wide variety of experience. He specializes in GT cars, where he competes in Black Pan World Challenge, IMSA, FIA, WC, and NASCAR. He's won the score wager of 1,000 Pikes Peak International Hill Climb and a 24-hour of Kota, and he is a sought-after driving coach. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. Appreciate you having me. So share us your journey about how you got into racing and what got you into the back of the driving seat and just wanting to really just race for the rest of your life. Yeah, you know, I was introduced to it early on. My dad was interested in cars himself, uh, not in any professional sense. He wasn't really in industry, but, um, you know, he just had a love for cars and he started doing a little car racing himself, actually, right before I was old enough to do it. So I would follow him to the track and drive his around in the neighborhood and stuff. Uh, and just, you know, had a, a love for it, started playing with, you know, working on cars and stuff early on with him. Uh, and then I started racing carts when I was 10 years old, just kind of local club level stuff and um, did that for a few years until I was old enough to start doing some track days and instructing for various events and built myself a little club race BMW E30 and uh, started out that route and then slowly started to find myself with uh, guys that wanted to, you know, go do some higher level racing and put me in their cars. And so it's just kind of snowballed from there. It's it's always uh, very common to hear that people have very different trajectories. And, you know, there's an element of luck involved and an element of um, people just kind of finding things from random sources and it all just kind of comes into play. Um, how did that break sort of come for you? Because obviously you have to develop your skills, but then you also need that break. So how did that come about for yourself? Yeah, I, you know, there are, I guess, maybe several different areas where I would say I got like a, a break and, you know, moved a step higher. Uh, when I was doing the, the club racing, the NASA level stuff in the BMW, I also uh, applied for this reality TV show on the Speed Channel at the time. Um, and they, so they did kind of a, you know, an elimination round, you know, type of TV series. And so I went through that and uh, won most of the races for that series uh, we ended up getting wrecked for the last event so i didn't get the big prize at the end but i got a lot of exposure out of it um and then in that process met a fan of the show that actually wanted to do some racing so he owned a, one of the cars that i raced early on in the trans am series um and i think getting into those higher level high horsepower cars pretty early in my career really helped me kind of launch into that air you know going the gt car route uh, rather than kind of, you know, where a lot of guys get stuck in sort of touring car type racing and have a hard time to move up to that next level. I was fortunate to get that opportunity early on. Uh, and so through that, then I met um, uh, a team owner here close to me in North Carolina that was running a Corvette and World Challenge at the time and had Ron Fellows, a, you know, a factory Corvette program guy that was racing in World Challenge for him. And so uh, at a last minute um opportunity he ron ended up running uh, one of the nascar road races and so the week of the event i was called in to run uh, the corvette in uh, mid ohio and we won the weekend and had a you know just an awesome time and so i got a full-time ride out of that the following year uh, and you know so i would say that was kind of the big moment where i kind of launched into actually making a career out of it and you know was able to pretty consistently run for that team for multiple years full-time and won a bunch of races in world challenge and uh, start getting opportunities in IMSA and other places. That's awesome. But obviously sponsorship is a huge part of this to keep the, the race um, activity, let's call it going, right? So how did you manage to secure your sponsors? And one, one kind of additional question on that is that obviously sponsorship is one aspect, but then there's also interacting with the fans. So, you know, once you talk and go through how you've managed to secure sponsorship in the past and how you've managed to sustain it too, you know, what I really want to know and discuss a little bit more is about how to kind of build that followership, that fan base that you can actually go to a sponsor with as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's always a struggle no matter what level you're at. And I, you know, I feel like it's still a struggle. You know, it's never anything that you just have got it down and it's always going to be good. Um, and, you know, the, that volatility of the industry is what makes it such a struggle. You know, even guys that have very well established careers are still always, you know, forced to hunt for the next thing. And I was pretty lucky in my first few years that I found myself in a team that had a strong sponsor, a uh, strong relationship with uh, Carlisle companies that put various brands on the car we were racing in World Challenge. And, and so we worked very well with them. And, you know, obviously, 
that tends to come and go. And so uh, it has been a struggle and then, you know, finding different rides uh, following that. But I would say, you know, my strength has kind of been, I think, relatability to fans because I came up through kind of a grassroots level and, and working on it from that avenue. Uh, and I was pretty early to kind of adapt to posting my onboard videos and uh, being pretty accessible, I think. And so there were a lot of people that, you know, related to me, I think, and, and that helped my, you know, my progression up through the ranks. Um, to be honest, I would say it's not one of my biggest strengths to go out and look for sponsorship. I, you know, I, I'm always working on it. And, but I think one of the big things that's been good for me is being able to coach amateur drivers. And so with the pro-am championships that we see now, uh, I tend to, you know, get the rides where I'm coaching a co-driver and, you know, helping them develop. And so it's for, to me, it's been, you know, more easy to find. Uh, somebody that has passion for the sport is just getting into it and kind of help them develop as a driver and, you know, and work with them and uh, drive with them on that level. So when you're working with these people who are a little bit more amateurs, what do you feel like they don't quite understand about the industry that people who are inside the industry understand very well? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I think a lot of people getting into it just assume if you go fast, you get rides and you become a pro driver and it's you know, obviously not that simple. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of fans too really see it that way. They don't understand how many of the participants are bringing budget and funding into the program on some level or another. And so it, it, it's kind of eye opening. I think when people realize how much work behind the scenes it takes to really get, you know, everything to work together where there's enough budget to run this championships and, um, so I, I think that's the biggest kind of naivete behind uh, people that are outside of it. Uh, and certainly just on a driving aspect, I think people don't realize kind of the high level that uh, most of the pro championships are even a very good driver at an amateur level. You know, that's won a lot of races in PCA or SCCA club racing will find it pretty difficult to jump in at most of the pro or pro am championships, you know, in IMSA or World Challenge. It's almost like being a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond. <laughs> kind of. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Choose one or the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and also one of the things that you mentioned was um, coaching, right? So did you uh, are now working with the Races 360, correct me if I'm wrong? Yes, that's right. So I spoke to Dion, you know, the founder of, of Races 360, and he was um, discussing like, uh, you know, what came, how we came up with the idea and things like that. So when did you actually jump on board um, with the Races 360 and how's that been for you? Yeah, it's been great. I, you know, I think Dion had that program kind of started and initiated a few years ago, but really I just in the last year or so has it been opened up to the level that it's at now where they have a platform for, you know, customers to upload and then have multiple different coaches that can work with uh, each customer and, and get feedback via data or video and, and get re your really personalized uh, coaching and great value out of it. Um, so I started, I, I guess, pretty early this year and, uh, it's been a great you know, thing. And I really enjoy the fact that you can work with people all around the world relatively quickly and, and give that quick, you know, feedback where I think a lot of the, you know, track day people, uh, and amateur racers have a hard time finding really quality information at a track. You know, they'll talk to somebody that's quicker, but maybe they can't explain why it is they do what they do or whatever, you know, they just drive quick. They don't know why. Um, and so I think that it's, uh, you know, it's been a great value for people to be able to get, you know, high level pro coaching, uh, really quickly and at a, at a great price. That's awesome. And like, uh, what sort of results do you see when you typically, um, are coaching with uh, these people like over time, how much are you shaving off time or what sort of, um, impact does it really have on their driving? Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell so far because there were early stages for this, you know, version or this iteration of Racers 360. So uh, we have had some returning customers already. And I know that uh, one of the ones that I work with uh, is a Specky 46 racer, uh, a NASA club racer here on the East Coast. Uh, and I've you know done probably three or four sessions with him now over a couple of months. And uh, he's gone a lot quicker. He was, you know, I would say back of the top 10, maybe in a competitive field before, and now he's top five or podium contender uh, at most of his races. So, 
you know, we certainly see good results, um, but some of them, you know, are still developing relationships and we've only done maybe one or two sessions with them. So I think certainly as it gets a little bit more time under it, uh, that'll be interesting to see. And is it a contract sort of thing? Like, do you have like 10 sessions or five sessions or how does it work? Uh, currently it's basically just one off. So, you know, as they, uh, have done a track day, they can come back and uh, after that review or, you know, they can plan ahead and say, Hey, I'm going to be at an event, uh, this weekend. Can we pre-schedule, you know, somebody to be ready to look at my video right after I get done? Um, but it's, yeah, it's no contracts. It's paid by the session. Um, and you know, different price structures for whether it's just looking at a lap or looking at a whole session, looking at a race, you know, to analyze racecraft. But um, all of it is very cheap, you know, considering what a lot of the coaches that are available to you uh, would typically charge for a whole day. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's uh, it's really good that you know people have that opportunity to, to actually get some real masterclass kind of coaches and. Um learn a lot so talk us through a little bit about um circuit studies as well that's something that you're involved with yeah circuit studies is a program that i started with a friend of mine another driving coach that works at the bmw performance center um we started doing a few virtual track walks uh and just kind of trying to get the same you know as racers 360 get a little bit more high level information out there and so we did kind of a entry you know eight or ten different tracks uh, of the bigger, higher profile of venues here that we frequent. And so we created kind of this, you know, documentation and a video webinar that you can log on and, um, you know, watch that and get some prep time. But, you know, it's basically for people going to a track for the first time or just, you know, wanting to get a little bit more information before their race weekend uh, so that they know what they're looking for and trying to uh, achieve when they get there. Um, and so that's a series that's we've kind of put on the back burner for the moment, but I think that we'll, you know we'll attack that and create a few more different tracks and get more available for that soon. That's good. That's good. I mean, like it's one of these things that again, the better the information, the better the drivers, the better the sport, and the more the fans love it, the more people that get involved. You know, so yeah. it's a bit of a cycle in some sense. And you've obviously competed in NASCAR. Um, you know, MSR, there's so many different competitions you've been involved with. So what would you say has been one of your favorites or what that you've loved the most or a specific race that you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to pick uh, one venue because I've had, a, you know, I've been fortunate to do a lot of different types of racing. I, I really enjoyed doing the sprint racing and world challenge for a few years when they were just short 50 minute races, no pit stops, you know, it was really aggressive, hard racing. I really enjoyed that. Um, Obviously, I've done a lot of endurance racing and like that too, uh, but I really enjoy the, the cars and the machines too, so it's been fun, like Pikes Peak, where you can just bring anything you want to, uh, and so I've you know been I had the opportunity to race against um, some really high-level equipment and just you know, be there, even though I wasn't in the same class like with the Volkswagen with Roman DeMa last year, just seeing that car and seeing how quick it was uh, was pretty cool. Um, so uh yeah it's really hard to choose one but i would say my favorite racing in general uh through my career has kind of been that world challenge sprint racing do you feel like there's a difference between the type of people that love sprint racing versus endurance racing uh yes and no i think you know it's now so many of the endurance races are a sprint you know you're being pretty aggressive but you have to be maybe a little bit more reserved uh, the hardest part for me as a driver is you know you have in endurance racing, you really have to have the whole program behind you, a really good team, great pit stops, great co-driver. And so it's harder to control all those different variables as a single person. Uh, whereas when you're just out there racing all by yourself, you know, you have to have a great team behind you to prepare the car and make the setup really good and all that. Uh, but once you get out there, it, it feels like you're, you know, it's a little bit more on you as the driver and taking on that pressure and that responsibility, I think, is part of what I really enjoyed about it. Um, so maybe it's because of that, that I gravitate towards that direction, being a little more in control of it, but, um, yeah, they're both a lot of fun. To what degree do you think you're in control as the driver inside the car, inside, inside the, the car? How, how much do you feel like as a percentage you're in control? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say quite a large percentage, maybe 90% or something. I mean, a lot of it is. You know, I don't want to downplay the importance of having the good car and having a, a team that sets it up well. Uh, but obviously, that's, you know, the driver's a big part of that, too, in GT racing, to be able to 
feel out what the different, you know, things the car needs are during the practice and qualifying sessions and prepare, you know, your setup for the way that you can get the most out of it. Um, but yeah, I think certainly in a sprint race, it puts a large percentage of, you know, the importance on the driver, you know, watching British touring car or something like that. You see that as well, where, uh, the driver really has to do everything very, very well to succeed. And one of these things that people always talk about is being in flow when you're a driver, right? And do you still get nervous like you used to before, or is this something you feel like now I know what I'm doing, just got to get in there and just get into my own headspace and block out the noise? Yeah, I would say that there's not too much uh, nervousness, maybe, you know, on the grid sometimes or um, during endurance races. For me, the, the nervous part is when you're the next stand up yeah, and yeah. it's getting close, but you never know exactly when that pit stop's going to fall based on strategy or whatever. So you're sitting there kind of, you know, ready, ready and go. Going up, going up, ready to go, but you can't do anything yet. And <laughs> yeah. You're just watching the monitor, seeing what your co-driver is doing. Um, so I think that's probably the hardest part, but once you get in the car, it all just starts to, to become natural again. Do you like, um, I mean, obviously, you know, having mistakes is, is a killer in, in this industry. So how often do you feel like, uh, these mistakes, um, as a percentage have dropped or is this something that when you have a, a mistake that you know, you shouldn't have made, it's, it's even worse because you judge yourself for being like, oh man, like, come on, you know, newbie, newbie, like the rookie mistake. <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly very tough. Um, you know, I think most of the time in my career, I've been the guy that is doesn't want to make a mistake. So I'm maybe a little bit con more conservative coming up. And then, you know, once I get a feel for what I can do in the car, you know, how the car works, um, it's a little bit easier. And then I, you know, I can push and be aggressive. I try not to be the guy that goes out there on the first lap in a new car and tries to, you know, go fast immediately. I think now that I have so much experience in different cars, I pretty much have an idea of what, you know, the limit is already. So, um, I can get there pretty quickly, but yeah, I, I, I think I've been pretty fortunate not to make any huge mistakes or even, I, I would say a few big mistakes, I guess, throughout my career. Um, they're always going to happen because you're always trying to, you know, push to that limit and sometimes you exceed it. But, um, yeah, I can think of a couple, certainly on street races, sometimes it's where there's really no margin. You know, if you just step out a little bit, it can make big consequences. So, um, yeah, I would say I'm always my worst critic and put the most pressure on me, you know, as much as anybody else. So it's always pretty devastating if you do, you know, have a mistake that, you know, was completely on you. It wasn't just a racing incident or something, but, mm. um, yeah, it's, it can be tough to deal with. I mean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine. And uh, one of these, one of these things that obviously impacts the way you take it is how you develop as a driver from day one. You know, what sort of mentality you grow um, about yourself, and um, what sort of performance you end up having on the track is obviously largely based on, you know, years and years and years of preparation for it. So, in your opinion, what do you feel is one of the biggest things that impacts the sort of um, driver you become the sort of uh, levels you achieve what what is it is it you know discipline is it um is it the the kind of mindset that someone has is it like what would you try and say are some factors or maybe one factor that really helps someone stand out yeah i mean obviously there's the difference between what makes you stand out on track versus off track and and those are both very important uh for me i think the biggest thing that's helped me on track is that i'm very analytical very self-critical so i'm always the guy that's you know come home watched hours of my video you know critiqued it you know to the extreme and so you know i've taught myself a lot uh by doing that and also on the same token you know being that I do so much driver coaching, it makes you think about why you do what you do rather than just going out and going fast. You have to be able to explain what it is, you know, that makes that process work. And so, yeah, I think I've become kind of a student of the sport because of that. And, and it's helped my own driving on many levels, but um, also you have to be able to stand out in the paddock and be somebody that's likable, you know, be somebody that knows everybody uh, so that you can know when the opportunities are available. And, um, as a guy that's maybe more reserved, not as outgoing, uh, that's a tough thing. You know, there's a lot of guys that are maybe a little bit more cutthroat about really pushing for the ride and finding the opportunities. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's always kind of a balance between how much of the off track stuff is a part of the game versus, you know, real life and real re relationships. And so 
I think for me, it's always been about creating those relationships that'll play out long term and where, you know, you'll be, you know, perceived as a good person that people want to do, do business with. So. How much important. do you think, um, if for, this is for new drivers, you know, people who are listening who feel like, you know, they can gain something out of this. What do you feel like they should be doing in terms of how much time they spend uh, working on things that are off track versus on track? I think uh, it pretty quickly has to become, you know, largely balanced to the off track side because you have to have, you have to have the fundamental basics, obviously, to do well on the track. Uh, but the guys that really succeed find that part really quickly, you know? So, um, obviously there are people that struggle more and on, on track and still make a, a career out of it. But I think the guys that really have found success are the ones where the driving part is very natural. Um, and obviously you can polish that and make it better all the time. But, um, yeah, I think the hardest part about making a career out of any of this is, um, you know, being very successful off track and, and working on all those relationships and the, the, the business side of it as much as possible. Yeah, cause, because naturally there's so many amazing drivers out there that the thing that they want to do is drive all the time. The thing that they don't want to do then becomes a thing that they have to do to do well compared to the rest of the people out there. Yeah, completely. Everybody, you know, drivers are naturally pretty selfish. So uh, you have to be able to think about the other side of it. You know, what can you do for somebody that makes them want to put you in a race car, you know? Like you said, there are a ton of drivers out there that can go really fast, but what sets you apart off track too, you know, that makes people want to have you in their race car. Yeah, it's, it's completely true. And thank you for sharing your experiences and your journey. And it's been a pleasure having you on the Race Coin podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. If you like this episode of the Race Coin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.